Debo going on his own. He gets the try. The Red 78. We're both monster people. Whoever gets over the line, try from us. Nobody knows monster rugby better. Hello and welcome along. I'm Alan Quinlan and you're listening to episode 58 of the Red 78 here on the Rugby Channel. And with me as always is Neve Briggs. How are you, Neve? How was your weekend? Good, Quinny. Yeah, great weekend of rugby. I think Six Nations is just bringing out the best of everything. So it's great. Yours, how was your weekend? Not so good. Spurs are slipping up again. I saw that, yeah. Anyway, the less is said, the better. Good win, bad win for them. Had you a game yourselves or were you coaching yeah. or training? Uh, yeah, we were playing in Estonians uh, in North Dublin on Saturday before the men's match. So we kicked off at half 12. Um, good game, got a win. So I got in to see the men's match straight away afterwards. So that was good. And then, uh, yeah, I think uh, the weekend off this weekend was just good. I think people need it. And uh, we will watch, go to, probably go to Thorne Park, I'd imagine. Okay, so... You mentioned a the match there, I think. Obviously, we got treated to great excitement the first weekend. And the first game on Saturday of the weekend of the Six Nations, Ireland-France, two best teams in the world, ranked one and two in the world. And it's incredible. I was in Murrayfield for, for Scotland-Wales, which was the second game. I was doing commentary for that. But just reading the reports and looking at uh, people tweeting and putting stuff on Instagram on Saturday night, um, Ireland are the real deal, are they? You know, I'm trying to be not get carried away, and I'm sure they won't want to either. But this was a, a brilliant win from a psychological point of view as well. Yeah, huge. I thought it was um incredible. I thought they answered a lot of questions in relation to being able to deal with the a bigger pack and and in terms of the French physicality, and I think that's carried on from November and the summer really in relation to. Last this time last year, they got fed up by France and Paris, and then to be able to turn it around. And I'm not talking about getting stronger. I'm talking about being smarter in around that collision zone. I think ball carriers often looking for space. There's always that little bit of footwork where um, they're they're kind of taking the contact on their own terms, and um, and their ability to generate quick ball is incredible. I think I saw an unbelievable stat there pop up during the game in relation to zero three rocks and. And that's what you want. That's, it's very difficult to live with it. And I just thought, um, but, but here's the thing. I actually thought France were brilliant as well. I thought that they, it was just a really, really good match. And my standout moment from, from the whole game wasn't really an Irish moment. It was uh, Dupont holding up Mac Hansen, uh just before his line. I just thought it was an, the most incredible piece of sheer will to, to keep his team in it. So, uh, yeah, I thought it was brilliant. A brilliant, brilliant game. Yeah, well, um, he's just such a good rugby player, isn't he? Dupont, oh my he's a phenomenal yeah. rugby player. It was an incredible game, and that's what kind of got me is, um, you know, the the English media ex players throughout the UK, Ireland, just saying commentators, journalists saying how good this game was, how how it was such a great advertisement for for the game or every rugby. We'll get more into the you know the pluses and minuses, and uh, there was. So many pluses for Ireland, for sure. Psychologically, winning a big game like that was was incredibly important, and um, just the resilience and the, and the the pace and the tempo that Ireland were able to play with. Again, some issues, but look, we'll talk about them in a minute. Um, what are the fans saying? They're you know obviously overjoyed. Um, will there be changes? I put a tweet out yesterday. Will is there a need to make changes? Can Ireland deal with this expectation pressure going forward? And um, what was the overall reaction online? Yeah, so John Tui, unbelievably good performance. Lots of depth in the squad and still building. Only the players stand between them and a slam. If they continue with Farrell's mantra of the best they can be, back row unit is now in the top of the world. Ian Moore, there should be changes. Kelleher, Henderson, Baird, Casey, Byrne, Henshaw, Araki and Larmer. Phil Quinlan, Ireland, superb strength and depth and all are, and arriving already in fifth gear. Barnes needs to go to tackle school. Uh, we'll we'll have a look at that. Um, Mark Lappin, I suspect Sexton will be rested for Italy. Huge challenge for Joey Carberry in the next few mor- months as Byrne took his chance yesterday. Joe, big psychological marker laid down against a top-class French side. Serious work rate from this Irish team and the bench were fantastic, which is reassuring. 
uh, George H. Dunnan, the players that came off and the points in the time that they did made the match an even more important win. The most important of the Andy Farrell era so far. Hitting big French carriers behind the gain line was crucial. Burn immense in that department. What What do you think is the... Like lots of tweets in relation to the physicality. What do you think is the big kind of shift in mindset in relation to... Not many players have changed on either side for the last 12 months. France were so physically dominant 12 months ago. Do you think it's the fact that they're away? Do you think it's the fact that Ireland have improved? It's it's you know it's I mean? um th- there's um all of the above. I think being at home is is uh, helps. I think Ireland would look back in that game last year in Paris and and realize that they didn't control parts of the game that they would have liked to, have, particularly around their lineout. It was disrupted. The gap was closed a lot in the lineout. I had highlighted some um issues they had in the lineout about delivering kind of good set piece ball and attacking France. Um, I think probably territorially they played a little bit too much in their own half. And France are really good. They, they I think you look at this game and uh, I think France will probably learn a lot from the performance in Dublin and and the defeat about, you know, playing in the right areas. And uh, I think they obviously added to the excitement in the early parts of the game in the first half because they were trying kind of outrageous passes and offloads and keeping the ball alive. Um, so I think what's changed is Ireland have got better. They've got mentally stronger. Mm. Um, their execution has gone to a, a very, very high level. And we saw that in New Zealand. Um, their attack, their cohesion, their fitness levels to be able to play at multi-phase. So lots, lots of parts of their game. You know, you the, the old kind of saying is when you play against a bigger side, move them around. It's it's not that easy. Um, it's about trying to keep the ball and and just their their speed of movement on the ground with the ball without the ball. So I think a lot of that has has imp- um has improved. They're a very well coached side, Ireland. There's still always a worry and concern. If you were looking at Ireland and thinking, um, how do you stop them? How do you go after them? You will think the first thing that comes into opposition coaches physical, get in their faces, slow their breakdown, go after their set piece. But Ireland are able to cope with the pressure that's coming. What's really telling is, and I don't think you'll you'll get this scenario again, um, France had 57 seconds and Ireland's 22. I know. Um, which is incredible to think. So that would indicate that Ireland managed to, to keep them out of there. And they still, still scored a rake of points. Well, they got penalties and stuff like that. No, I know. But the I know. Yeah, so usually France are kind of spending a lot of time in the opposition 22 mm. and that's where they hurt teams with that power, um, you know, one-out runners, offloads. Um, so Ireland have learned a lot, I think. Yeah. If this game was in France, would France win it? Yeah, it could have. It could go either different way. And and, and 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 yeah. anything. Yeah, it's a totally different yeah. prospect in different September. Prospect. But Okay, um, just a couple more, sorry. Uh, Daniel Casey... Would love to see Baird in ahead of Byrne because I reckon he'll be out for a while. Uh, I hope not, though. Would also love to see someone get a run of 15 as could be an issue if Keenan gets a knock. Morris Murphy, I'm so impressed by Ireland yesterday. Pace, power and the mantra seems next man up. Building good squad depth and the questions at the tight head and 10 position have been put to bed. I'd like to see the likes of O'Toole, Bird, and Killer get some game time now in Italy. Scott's game is huge. Tom Lundergan, the big picture of this weekend's Six Nations, if not the entire Six Nations Championship. The performance from Ireland was just amazing and worthy of the number one ranking. Hugo Keenan was huge, my man of the match. Recovery from that often brutal, powerful, intense game is essential. There will be changes versus Italy. Barron's got two very controversial calls wrong. Ireland 20s went well against France and they too look unstoppable. Ospreys look good beating Tigers away in the high note. Munster will write them off at your pearl. The next block of three home games are a huge must for us. Tom has literally squeezed in everything into those two tweets. Fair play um, to him. And, far- and Farrell. Uh, Farrell, be wary of the big shake-up for Italy and Ireland. Other than enforced changes, he might give Byrne Casey a start. Uh, George, sorry, Adrian Egan, Adrian Harrington, my apologies. Ireland were superb. Wayne Byrne should never be allowed to officiate again after that terrible decision in the build-up. Late hit on Sexton unnoticed. No arms tackle on low. Scotland away is a daunting fixture. Um, 
educated but ignored. I would imagine changes in two weeks. Ross Byrne will start. They've got coin two. Henshaw will be in with Bundy if Henshaw is fit. Henderson likely starts too. Craig Casey might start also. Um, and lastly, um, the one upside of the red card, of, the one upside of the no red card for Antonio on Saturday was that there were no doubts or excuses surrounding the result. With an exception of an automatic replacement for Keenan, we can legitimately claim to have the makings of two serious test teams now. Sexton said so much after our training session this week. Okay, some really interesting points in there. Um, the first one, before we get into the performance ourselves, I'm going to add, we're going to talk about. Um, I think the comments there on Wayne Barnes, uh, with respect that he should never referee again, is very, yeah. very heavy, and it's too far. I think Wayne Barnes actually tried to let the game flow, and it was a brilliant, you know. Most of the things he did in the game were superb. There's two things that were wrong, and I'm sure uh, Fabian Galtier and Andy Farrell can go back, as they always do, with their reports and their own video analysis and say, well, this was missed, this was missed, this was missed. It's so hard to get everything right. It's impossible. Yeah. I thought he did really well, other than probably looking for longer and looking for a different angle, but he needs a TMO to help him. Uh, for the James Lowe try, I think he's left foot or right foot. I don't know which one it was. Uh, clips to the ground. Very, oh, look, very we've, yeah, we've totally seen and, all uh, the, the stills. 100%. And uh, so I think he that need that's that's wrong that that wasn't picked my, up. My my big thing about the 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 Antonio red card or the yellow card. Sorry. Look, Let's finish 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 the the, the James Lowe one first because I want to say. About uh, Damien Pinot, his tackle on James Lowe, then could you could argue that it possibly could have been a no arms tackle and it prevented a try, so it could have been. But Ireland got away with one there, Neve. We, we admit that. And I, as a commentator, and lots of other people, um, we often give out about the when you go to France and you do commentaries, whether it be in the, the Champions Cup or internationals, that you're looking for replays. Why show us a different angle on the whether it be foul player and the act of scoring a try? And if it goes against France, you just don't get that replay. Um, so that replay should have been given. Now, we don't know for sure if Brendan Pickerel, the TMO, had got the an angle from behind which would indicate and show the picture. Those pictures come out after the game, a couple of hours later, that everybody can see it and stop it and press pause on your sky at home and, and zoom in and take a picture of it and make it bigger. Um so we're not sure the process, and it put it makes it hard on the referee. So we don't know if 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 he if the TMO had that picture, we don't know if it was held back or if he had all the pictures. So we can't, you can't just jump to the conclusion that the TV director didn't give it to him. You can't jump to the conclusion that he ignored it, the TMO. Um, but I think it's a big, big decision, and it goes against France. But as I said, it could have been a yellow. Okay, I'm sorry for interrupting you. The yellow card situation for Antonio. So we acknowledge, I think, that Ireland got away with one there. Um, but the yellow card with Antonio's tackle on on Rob Herring. For me, I, I, I watching the game, I wasn't there because, as I said, I was in Edinburgh. I really thought that there was no mitigation in this. There, you could go, you're going an inch or two here. It was very much on the top part of his chest neck area but there is a, a connection where it comes up then and the contact in, in the side of his jaw I thought it was with force there was no dip at all from Antonio and uh, I was shocked really and in, in to say that these are the type of tackles need for me that we're trying to get out of the game and we're trying to stop this and I saw always talk about players behaviours players behaviours when I say that I mean when you shoot out of the line to kind of rinse someone with a big tackle, you must be in a low position. And mm. if the player dips into you then, but if you're staying in an upright position and you're shooting out of the line to put in a massive hit on somebody, you're, 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 you run the risk of being in that red card area and it's not worth it. I, and that's my, what my, I say about the behaviours. And I think yeah. he doesn't dip at all. So what was your take on the tackle? So I have look oh, completely and utterly a red card for me. Um, but my 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 thing is I actually kind of feel a little bit sorry for the referees in the in these scenarios. So last year, 
World Rugby comes out, any any kind of head on head straight away red card, straight away red card, and all of a sudden we're seeing games with twelve and thirteen players as opposed to fifteen v fifteen, and people are putting them under pressure, clubs are putting them under pressure, coaches are putting them under pressure, supporters are putting them under pressure, and they decide to bring in this checklist, and the checklist is literally just trying to get, I feel, the referees to to almost find ways to keep players on the pitch. And I just think that that's a really difficult situation. It, I think 12 is. months and you ago, know, and Wayne you know Barrett was like, that's a red card. And but I, like I no think, more. and Neve, I agree with trying to keep him on the pitch unless they're absolutely blatant and you have to try and find mitigation. And sometimes there's a change of direction and there's a little dip and it's, it's accidental and not reckless or dangerous. And... You know, people are saying there's no intention here. Like, he's looking to put a massive hit in here. And that's my point. It's hard to kind of he's upright. get he's it very across. Upright. If you're willing to come out of the line and really put a big hit on someone, you have to be lower. And you must practice that he does not dip at all. No, I, I know that. Right, what I'm right, just saying... The, look... the right arm is tucked. So, and I agree with you. So, he mm. start, Wayne Barnes started looking for ways. And, and fairness, you start on a red and you work your way down. And that's the way the process goes. So he worked his way down to a yellow, and he based it on the fact that the uh, there was a it wasn't a high level of danger. For me, it was a really high level of danger because his arm is tucked. If the arm comes up here, then you're in a situation that was at the top of the chest, and you know did it hit the chest first? But because the arm is tucked in tight, he, I know he's trying to tag the ball probably. But he must show more of a, a rap with the right. Yeah, arm. he's moved in force. But like, Rob Harry doesn't come back on the pitch. Like, yeah, there yeah. is. Do you know what I mean? Like, Rob Harry doesn't come back on the pitch. I'd be interested to see if anything, like, as in, do they come out and say anything in relation to the thought process? But I, I genuinely feel that the referees are kind of being backed into a corner in relation to those mitigations. It's, it's a difficult it's job. Very difficult, it's very difficult. It's a really difficult, difficult job. And yeah, Wayne yeah. Barnes is a very, very good ref. Um and you know I, I agree think, yeah I just he think he has he has two right assistant part. referees there in a the TMO and I think because and some of the stuff to the point you're making as well they're trying to rush through this and not delay it too long anymore obviously sometimes things these things have taken too long um but I think there needs to be a little bit more time given to this and they need to have a conversation together to go what's your opinion Matthew Carley's face when he went yellow indicated that. It was a big let off here, and that it was possibly mm. the wrong decision. Um, look, Wayne Barnes is human, but he is a brilliant referee. But I just think, in my opinion, and most people's opinion, it was a red card. Um, one of the tweeters uh, says there um, that they were glad it wasn't a red because we've no excuses. And look, if, if France went down to 15, 14 early on in the game and Ireland won, it would leave a bit of a cloud over it, but it didn't happen. But I just say, we'll move on from this. We're both in agreement it was a red. Mm. It should have been a red. And we need to protect the players and we need to stay on course with this protection of the players. Um, the other points one of the tweeters mentioned was um, Tyburn. So Tyburn obviously has, and it looks like an ankle injury. It doesn't look great. Um Who's his replacement? So I'll call out the locks. It's Tyburn, Ian Henderson, Joe McCarthy, James Ryan are the four locks that were picked for for uh, for the Six Nations. Ryan Baird is that player that can play in the back row and the second row. So does Ryan Baird come straight into the team? Does Ian Henderson come start in the team? Or does Joe McCarthy go in? I think he will, based on how he selected the last couple of weeks, I think he'll start Ian Henderson. Ryan Baird will come onto the bench. If it was me, I'd start Ryan Baird and have Ian Henderson coming off the bench. Uh, I think Ryan Baird's in the form of his life at Leinster coming into the Six Nations. I think he's the most gifted athletically back row slash second row I've seen in ever. I think it's just in terms of from, from, from Ireland. I just think he's got the ability to um to play at the back row or in the back row he, he can mix it up physically now I think he's put on a bit of bulk but it's his hands his ability over the ball his running lines I just thought he was he, him and Darius were really the four, the two foreign players coming into this Six Nations and I was just uh, surprised I understand Henderson offers you bulk and he offers you power 
Um, but um, yeah, I think if it, that's Ryan, the case, Ryan think, Baird is Ryan Baird has got stronger yeah. and and more physical. I think I just think I, he's class. I agree with you. He's he's a phenomenal athlete, a phenomenal athlete, and I think he would add so much to Ireland's attack. Um, and the way they play the game. Um, it's a, interesting. We put we both agree on that. I I put Ryan Baird in there. I think Ian Henderson from from. A historic point of view and and the quality he's shown over the years and and the top level that he's played at, I don't think he looks himself fully yet. He's been mm. out for a period of time and he's got to have more involvements. And I know it's difficult coming into a game like that. It's a big game. He did well, didn't do anything wrong, but I think you know he needs to he needs you to need have more more, an more involvements from him and yeah. more impact from him. Um, the other argument could be on Joe McCarthy. You put him in with James Ryan. He brings that physical presence and a bit of a real kind of aggressive type of power game, um, which could be needed as well going forward against against physical sides. So um, the fullback situation. So Hugo Keenan, it's an interesting one. Someone asked me if Hugo Keenan gets injured. And, and again, one of the tweeters there talks about it. Um, who goes full back for Ireland if Hugo Keenan gets injured? We'll just name out the players that are picked in the squad. Yeah. So the back three players are Keith Earls, Mac Hansen, Hugo Keenan, Jordan Larmer, James Lowe, Jimmy O'Brien, Jacob Stockdale. So the ones that jump out for me is Jimmy O'Brien or Mac Hansen, the full back. I don't know if you agree. Jordan Larmer played there before. Uh, Jimmy O'Brien, 100%. Yeah. No, no, Jimmy O'Brien has to be for me. Yeah, Has Jordan Lambert played, played full back for Ireland before. Yeah, and I don't think it would respect him. No. I think he it's it's um, for me it's Jimmy O'Brien every day. Jordan Lambert is a phenomenal player, and he's a guy I would love to see get an opportunity against Italy and have some involvement. I think he is a big part to play in Ireland going forward. Jordan Lambert, he's formed this year has been superb with Leinster, but I agree, Jimmy O'Brien. Um, he's so similar to Hugo Keenan with the 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 the, the competitiveness in the air. The, you know, makes no mistakes. He's just so reliable in everything he does. He's a try scorer as well. Um, I was really, really surprised that he didn't make the bench for the first two games. Like that's how I esteem I would hold him. He he covers every every single position he could play for you across the back line, probably bar ten. Yeah, and he's he probably could do a job there. as well. Yeah, I just Matt, think Matt Hansen is someone could go to full back as well. So there is options there. They're not. Um, yeah, I would worry about Matt Hansen's defense. But um, yeah, I, that's I think Jimmy Bryan's solid. Okay, so we've we've those tweets all covered off, and uh, um, we talk about more changes in a sec. Just on the performance, um, the big positives were number one, they started the game, uh, they went three points down to France, but their body language, their shape, their attack, uh, their work rate, all that stuff was through the roof. I think territorially was the one I mentioned. I think from the stats, um, 64% of territory. How did Ireland manage to do that, Neve, and not give France entries into it? We hear this quote, entries into the 22. How did they manage to do that so well? I, I, there was a couple of things. So I think they managed the tempo really, really well. So I think when they were on top and had an ability to get the edges and hold on to possession, like, Lots of times they went five, six, seven plus phases, and that obviously denies anybody um, entries or, or possession. So I think they did that quite well. I think Murray's box hitting was really, really good. I thought, but not only that, I thought the chase was brilliant because so France were current, constantly kicking on Ireland's terms as opposed to their own. Um, I thought they shut down any threats in around That's the That's an really interesting quickly. one, the kicking on Ireland's terms because. Mm. Um, Ireland kicked the ball 39 times, France 37. You could say if you didn't know the result in the match and you were given that stat, you'd say, well, it was a bore, boring match. But it wasn't. It was the opposite because I think the kicks were really intelligent from both sides. France do kick the ball a lot up the middle of the field. They want to turn you around, pressurise you. Um, so kicking can be effective in the game and you can still get a good game. Kicking on 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 Ireland's terms, what does that mean? Does that mean that there's pressure in front of them and they have to kick it quickly? They don't have time to settle? Yeah, so they close down space really quickly in terms of um, if Ireland kicks long and um, they came up, they, they didn't offer a pass to another player, French back three player to be able to kick. And also when they kicked, they covered the background really, really well so that when France were in to kick and they kick long, 
or they go to kick to the tram lines. Ireland had all the space covered, so they were very rarely finding grass either in front or behind Ireland. And and also because Ireland's defensive line is such a huge threat, they didn't want to kick it off the park very much. So then all of a sudden, Ireland are winning those battles all the time, those kick tennis battles. And and France just didn't really have an answer to that, I don't think. Um, but it, it's constant pressure. It's to do with the line speed. It's to do with the escorts coming off the or on working off the ball. But it's really to do with how smart they kicked. They, they you know what I mean. If they kicked long, very rarely. They found grass quite a bit, and like the likes of Sexton or or James Lowe, and but they also trusted themselves to get it off the park enough to be able to compete in the lineout. And I just thought, from a technical or a tactical point of view, Ireland had, you know, kicked way more on their own terms than France did. Okay, the other stat that jumps out at me from the performance, and it's probably a negative one when they look back at it, is thirty-eight missed tackles. That's an incredibly high number. Again, it's a number if you got before being told to score the game, you'd be saying, well, that team probably lost the game. France had 24 missed tackles. It just indicated it was frantic. It was crazy. Um, and like some of the missed tackles are in very, very close areas where players are kind of bouncing around the place. They're not necessarily running through making line breaks because um, I was highlighting some good defence and looking back on some of it. And some of the good defensive plays from Ireland, there was two, three missed tackles in the lead up to it. Um, so it was incredible and it was just it's hard to explain those stats isn't it so yeah I think it's um, a lot to do with the, the is that evasion from the French players and just yeah, really good footwork say, yeah footwork footwork from the French players and I think what you're trying to do a lot of the time is especially when Dupont just goes goes lateral and he you know he's prodding and he's prodding and he's he's trying to find small little gaps what you don't want to do is you don't want to you don't want to commit fully to that tackle because he has the ability to find space from an offload around that tackle, or he's the ability to kind of suck you in and then be able to throw a five or 10 meter pass. So if you can just get a half a shoulder in while keeping an arm kind of free to be able to stop that offload or wait for somebody to jam in beside you, you're effectively missing the tackle. You, but can't, you can't tackle Dupont though, because he no, runs sideways, backwards, yeah, yeah, spins but he's, one way. That's what I'm saying. So, but while you're down as missed tackles, a couple of times in relation to those three or four and around the breakdown, the t- integrity of the line outside it is what allows those players missing those tackles to not get punished. If that makes any sense. Yeah, he was incredible. And uh, th- those missed tackles, I think uh, seven clean breaks for Ireland. Um, France had six clean breaks. Uh, six offloads, Ireland, 12 France. Uh, the three line outs Ireland lost, I thought, even though you kind of would say, well, they're small numbers. And we often talk this about Munster, you know, one, two, three lineouts in a match is, is is one, two, three, too many, if you know what I mean. Yeah. So I think there was a couple of times as well Ireland were held up over the line. I think they got a little bit bunched and tight and, um, okay, and reporter scores the pick and go. But I think four times Ireland were held up over the line. I think there was a chance to put a pa- two pass or two at times That's, Yeah. And, and score. So I think if they look back and analyse this game, they'll be couple of opportunities um the big the big positive they conceded one try and it was a freakish try from unbelievable play from the french players um if gary ringrose makes a tackle they don't score if mac hansen if the ball bounces different from him he could be making a clean break so they didn't allow france into their into their own 22 or in half really and i think they deserve credit. We're not going to go into any more stats. They deserve massive credit for dealing, number one, dealing with the tag of being number one in the world. Ultimately, no matter what happens in the Six Nations, um, and I think all the fans will agree, it'll be down to what happens at the World Cup, really. And But in the here and now, we should celebrate this, you know, their ability to play absolutely brilliant rugby and play at such a high standard. And I think the coaches deserve it. And you're a coach. Um, no matter how good the player you have, you still have to implement a plan. You have to get people around on the same page. You have to develop how you want to attack, how you defend, all that kind of stuff. And I just think all the individual pieces for 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 Ireland are really really strong. You know, their their mall, their contact uh, work, uh, their scrum was brilliant. Finley Bealham again, massive credit to him. You know, he's he's gonna. You know, he's been the biggest plus for Ireland in these last two weeks. 
um, the way he scrummaged and played around the field. Um, so there's loads of positives there. And, uh, you know, as I said, World Cup is World Cup, but here in the here and now, Ireland are in, in yeah. just incredible form. We'll just go, move on from that because we got to want to have a quick look at the Ospreys on Friday night for Munster. It is a Munster podcast, but we have to talk about Ireland. Right. Can we, can, yeah, can we just talk about the Munster players that played last weekend just briefly? Because, yeah, okay, uh, Conor Murray, you, you were trumpeting Conor Murray last week and frustrated a little bit by the criticism. You said that openly. Um, Incredibly tough week for him with his dad. Um, the accident he had, been in an induced coma. Um, obviously, I think uh, for Connor to play, there's things are obviously looking more positive uh, for his dad Jerry. Um, but you still need a lot of resilience to go out and perform with the distraction of that all week and and to play well again. Um, and Craig Casey came off the bench and brought you know a really good performance again. So. Um, it was a tough week for Conor Murray to deal yeah, with that. Was, yeah, and I thought he was just brilliant again. I thought um, his, you know, <clears throat> the more he plays this kind of game now, so the more he plays with Ireland, the more he goes back and plays a similar game at Munster, the more we get to see Conor Murray that we knew before the last few years of um, of, of, of the Johan Van Grani era where the, the, the style of game was to slow everything down and to kick us. I think it's taken him um, time to be able to get up to speed and scratch. Not not really his body, I think it was his brain. Um, and he's done that over... I see, I thought he had been doing really well for Munster um, before the Six Nations. And um, he's taken his opportunity now really, really well. And I thought, you know, when Ireland were on top, the ability to move the ball very quickly was really, really good. His, his pass was excellent. But it was his management around the the... The scoring zone, his management of those forwards, and his ability to exit really well. It's like that is something that we can't overstate. An international match against the number two team in the world. And um, I thought he was just, uh, for me, a big thing in it that we don't talk enough about is his defensive work. It's that unseen work that nobody really sees because we think of the nine, he's behind the line or he's dropped back, but not with the, with the way Ireland defends. He, he's in that line and his, his tackle tech, his ability to get off the line. His ability to fall around, I just, yeah, I thought it was really good. And 100% you nailed it in relation to Craig Casey. I thought he did really, really well when he came on, uh, both him and Ross Byrne. And I think that's a huge um, a reassurance for the coaching group, for the playing group, for those players that, you know. For, for the players is, individually, for Dave yeah. Kilcoyne to be back in the mix as well and, and looking yeah. like that bit of spark is back in him. Yeah. Unfortunately, Pete, Ty Byrne got it. Uh, yeah, I thought unfortunately, Pete. Ty Byrne got an, an an injury, and we don't know what that is yet, or how it's 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 um it's an ankle injury, I think. Um, hopefully, well, he's on he's on a, in a boot that. and on crutches after the game on TV. So, um, I and thought Peter Romani was... again played really oh, well. Geez. Yeah, he did. Like, is there um, is there you, constants? Sometimes the stats, um, you know, for individually don't indicate you know, a high number of carries and, and, and stuff like that. And sometimes they're true that you don't have many involvements and you have a quieter game. But I think, look, he's he's work around the field. He's he's tackling. He's His first uh, and second arrival. He's clearing out of, out of the break time. Are, yeah, yeah it's, are, it's are, and, literally, and, and and his clean out, actually, by the way, for Hugo Keenan's try is what makes the gap. So he comes in, he literally cleans out and he pops back to his feet, but he turns his hips a small bit if you go back and watch it. And there's a subtle so little means, bump of Cyril Boy. Yeah. So then you just can't get around. You can't fall around. And oh, like that's the, the unseen work that I uh, people need to realise. So good, good involvements from the Munster players. And sorry to yeah. any Leinster, Ulster, Connacht ones here, but we have to <laughs> mention the Munster players. The rest of them were brilliant as well. Um, Not so good news for... Well, look, it's great news for Ross Bourne. And I thought with jo Johnny Sexton coming off early in that second half for Ross Bourne coming on, this is a big moment for him. He yeah. looked very assured, astute in what he was doing. And that is a massive, massive plus for, for, for Ireland. We're all Ireland fans here and we want them to, to do as best they can and do well at the World Cup. The debate has been going on about Johnny for years and he's played at such a high level and been a great leader. But I thought Ross Bourne coming on... Yeah. Um, it's not the best news for Joey Carberry in the world, but look, that's Joey Carberry's got to deal with that and try and find form with Munster. But for Ross Bourne, I think he deserves massive credit, um, you know, for for turning this whole thing around and not panicking, uh, 
you know, obviously what happened in Aust- against Australia in November would have been great for his confidence. But on Saturday, he came on and played brilliantly. Brilliant. Yeah, so good. And I think the more that he gets that game time with Leinster and he's playing as well as he is, he's now starting to come flat to the line. He's he's engaging defenders. His kick pass is one of the best in the world. So, yeah, look, for, it's funny what confidence can do to you, isn't it? It can just it can totally elevate you and... um uh yeah, for me he's he's now the clear number two at the moment in terms of um you know confidence and game time and 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 the and the ability to play to that plan. Yeah, just finally on changes, um, will Gavin Coombs get a run? Who knows? We're speculating. I think we both would love to see him. The Munster fans would love to see him get a get a some involvement in that twenty three. I think Andy Farless would be very careful here. There's a couple of players that. Uh, there'll be a couple of changes, there's no doubt. I think Ross Bourne will probably start. Johnny's got a bang or a knock. We don't know what that's like. Um, if Bundyak, uh, Bundyaki probably needs game time, Robbie Henshaw could be back in the mix. Ryan Baird, uh, as we mentioned, Joe McCarthy. Um, they won't he won't change that much. He can't. He, You've got to respect Italy and momentum. people talk about it. It's and, not like you've a week off next weekend, so they have a week off. Then they play Italy and then they have another week off. So it's not as if there's two good breaks here. So I think you've got to respect Italy and pick pick a pick a strong side um that are you know can go there and get your result. It's going to be difficult, uh, no matter what team goes there. And I think they've got to respect them and and, and I'm sure, I think they will. I think there'll be a couple of tweaks to Andy Farrell's side. We will be doing a, a, a piece of Are You Watching Andy Farrell after the Munster match, seeing as we're in the middle of a Six Nations. Um, okay, brilliant results. Um, they deserve a lot of credit for where they are yeah. at the moment. Um, that's not to say they can come on stock sports, as it can be strange and it can turn, but at the moment, you know, it's a hat tip to the Irish team. They've been, you know, superb. All the players, Jamie Osborne might come in the mix as well. We didn't mention him, Jacob Stockdale. There's a load of them there that would mm-hmm. be banging on Andy Farrell's door saying, Oh, give me a start or give me some involvement, but who knows what will happen. He's capped 30 players since he's taken over, Andy Farrell, which is a big number of players in a World Cup cycle. And he's played 66 or 7 players in that time. So I think he's managed this period. And you think back two years ago, there was criticism of, of Andy Farrell and Mike Cat uh, when they lost to Wales, France, um, and probably the previous November, there was a bit of criticism in that Nations Cup ga- uh, campaign. Um. So yeah, they've turned it around. They deserve massive credit. We'll move on to Monster just finally. Um, obviously we have a Monster game to talk about Friday night. <clears throat> we don't know what team will play. I think it'll probably be similar to, uh, the team that beat Benetton a few weeks ago. I'm sure Keith Earls will come back and and be mm. involved. Will Craig Casey? It's probably doubtful with Jamison Gibson Park being out. Uh, for the period of time. Uh, question mark, would Gavin Coombs be involved with Ireland? If not, will he be back with Munster? We don't know. Dave Kilcoyne. I think, I think the likes of um, Coombs and Earls should, probably would have, like, should be released back. They have a note, you know what I mean? In terms of just give them a little, you could, you could cap the minutes, but just give them game time so that if they are involved the following weekend, it's not three or four weeks since they've played. Do you know what I mean? So, um, that would be the hope, I'd imagine. Yeah, I'm sure Munster will be trying to trying to get some players back because it's a really, really, really crucial game for Munster against the Ospreys on Friday night. Um, the team that played against uh, Benetton a few weeks ago, like Shane Daly was full-back, Calvin Nash, Anton Frisch, Fekatoa, Liam Coombs, Carberry, Paddy Patterson, you'd probably see a similar back line. Yeah, so then, obviously Calvin Nash, Nash is off yeah, injured. He's, he's yeah. be, is he out? Is he back? Uh, no, he's he's back kind of training this week. He was as Jan Film yeah, and um but it's 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 a it's a you know, it's look sore kind of an injury. So it was depending a injury, on whether they want to then, take yeah, whether the, they want to take chance at him. Forwards that started with Josh Richley, Niall Scandal and Roman Salanoa, John Klein, Finney Richley, Jack O'Sullivan, Hod, John Hodnett and Alice Candela. That that was the team. So it's probably going to be a similar, similar side. Um, you'd imagine Jack would only who would come back in there his band yeah so and it's uh, but will Roman you, get a chance will he be allowed to play do you think well he should Back be the Irish game camp. time doesn't he yeah it's yeah. game time and um, it would be great for him I think it's uh, it's uh, it's 
we, we, we never mentioned Tom O'Toole there. We should have mentioned him as well. We're yeah, talking about incredible. Finley Bealham. Tom O'Toole did brilliantly when he came on. Mm. So he deserves massive credit. Apologies to Tom. He's probably uh, waiting for the podcast to come out so he can listen in and see that he get a mention. No, he was brilliant. He was really good. So that that's another big plus. We, we just mentioned yeah. Finley Bealham. So, you know, Roman Salerno has to come back and play. And I think... Um, He's, it's such an important game. If you look at the Ospreys team, and I think someone mentioned it there. So basically, um, the Ospreys have played 13, won four, drawn two, and lost seven. So mm. they're 24 points and they're 12th in the league, which would indicate this is, uh, you know, and Munster oh. should win this game. But another tweeter mentioned their, their Champions Cup form and the performances in Montpellier That's and Leicester. Too. Um, they won back to back games in Mon- uh, or home and away against Montpellier. They won in Leicester. Um, I think their form has been, you know, outstanding in Europe, and they've really, really got their act together. Really, from that kind of December run on. Now, Toby Booth, their coach, won't be pleased with the league position. Um, so the potential players who could, like I was just saying, thinking about this, would Justin Tipperick play this weekend? Alan Wynne Jones. It depends, obviously, what Warren Gatland is thinking with France the following week. Are they in his plans going forward for a World Cup, or could they be? Could we see him in Thomond Park on Friday night, even to get game time? Even without those guys, Nicky Smith, the the loose said he's a very good player. Uh, Tom Bolta. And they caused us problems in the scrum time. They caused Leinster yeah. problems in the scrum, scrum time as well in that recent game. Um, they have a lot of experience. Reese Davies um, came off the bench the weekend. Would he be a release back? Bradley Davies, Scott Baldwin, these guys. So this is a good, solid side that has not, the results don't reflect how potentially strong they could be. It's a real, real, real must-win game for, for Munster on Friday night. This is the start of these three home fixtures. Munster play Ospreys, Scarlet and Glasgow at home in the next three games. And, you know, obviously they're sitting sixth in the table um, for anyone that wants to know on 37 points. Uh, can't afford to lose any of these three, in my opinion. No, absolutely not. Especially with the fact that they're going to South Africa. Um, and I think it's really, really important. But I... I'd be very surprised if they didn't win and win well this weekend. I just think they're on another level in terms of confidence. I think they're they've grown so much really since since you know probably that South African A game. We speak about it all the time. It seems to be a real pivotal point, and um, and I think that uh, the way they're playing now, I, I, irrelevant if Alwyn Jones or Justin Tipperick are going to be playing, I still think the Munster will have too much in their areas. Is, is, is that risky in any way, Neve, in a sense that, and me being the devil's advocate here, which I'm good at, that, okay, they finished that block losing three games, I think 11 matches, won eight, lost three, two to Toulouse, one to Leinster, really positive, big turnaround, um, week off, nice and relaxed, back training, um, home game, is it not dangerous that they could that, that expectation is there now that maybe oh gee, we just win this game, and Ospreys come over and cause them problems? Is that a risk? Is that I think if you're a coach, are you, if you're a coach, more. so what are you saying to them this week? Are you trying to really focus in on getting their heads right for this game? I I I understand exactly what you're saying about the way they've been playing. They should have confidence, but I'd be kind of wary about what kind of side is going to come here for the Ospreys. They're desperate in the position they're in the league, um, with five games left, they'd be saying, right, we have to win five games to get into the playoffs. So, But Munster need to be desperate too because they've had such a, 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 a tough start. But there's nothing banked for Munster. They also know that they have to go to South Africa. So, no, I think that they're... I think that that's enough to focus the minds, but I do think that they should, they should be confident in terms of what they're trying to do. They should be... Um, no, like... I think we have to trust the coaching group, the player group more that they're mentally going to be tuned into this in terms of, I feel like even when they were playing Toulouse and, and Leinster, you know, the following week we got games, we got we got moments where, um, you know, it would have been easy to to slip away or to, to switch off and, and they haven't done that. They just think they're just, yeah, they're just improving all the time. So um, I 100% believe that um, 
we should be we should be winning these games. Yeah, we're all getting excited. We're hearing RG Snyman is training more and more and more each week. Uh, it's probably a week. This game is probably a little bit too early because the conditions yeah. and stuff. Yeah, I'd imagine so. Look, this we we had said last week anyway, and it'll probably be in around the Scarlets game that we'll see him because they had this week and then they have another week off. And, then and Graham Roundtree has game. mentioned that publicly that mm. you know he's looking at possibly this, the that Scarlets game. So I think all Munster fans would just can't wait to see him back. Yeah. The other injuries as well, Tom Ahern. I'm not sure he still has a bit to go. Um, Edwin Adogbo. Um, you could certainly do them do with those guys back for 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 the run in. Um, anyway, we've a monster game Friday night. Look forward to it. Hopefully, they can get a result. They need one uh, again, um, and we'll be able to analyze that next week and see is there any, see is there any monster players that catch Andy Andy Farrell's eye. But we have to, you know, honest honestly have to just. I was so impressed with Ireland without getting carried away. I just think Andy Farrell has done a remarkable job. No matter what happens in the future. This has just been a, an incredible period in time for not just the wins, but the way this team is playing. They're they're on top now and everyone is going <laughs> to try and figure out how do they knock them. Um, so they deserve massive credits. Well done to them. Uh, fingers crossed for Munster on Friday night. Um, so that's it for episode 58. 50, yeah, 58. I'm getting the numbers right um, of the red 78 here. So press subscribe. Uh, send us any messages you want any feedback from the game and uh, we'll be back next week to analyse the Munster game and look forward to to Ireland going to Italy as well thanks Neve. thanks Benny The Red 78 with Alan Quinlan and Neve Briggs nobody knows Munster rugby better I'd like to think I know a lot 